Okay, hello YouTube. Um, we're going to be continuing our exploration of the Open Sicilian, and in this video specifically what I'm going to be talking about is the Lasker Pelican variation. So if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, uh, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So the Lasker Pelican variation is probably one of the most important variations that you're going to learn within the Open Sicilian. So it happens after e4, c5, Knights, knight f3, and it can happen after a number of different moves from here. And that's why it's so important, because transpositionally, this is the most common line that can be achieved through any number of move orders. So the main move order that people achieve this line from is knight c6, d4, cd4, knight d4, and then knight f6, knight c3, e5, knight on d to b5, d6, and then bishop g5. But just to give you an idea of how versatile of a system this is, we can achieve this from a bunch of different move orders. We can achieve this exact same position from e6, and then after d4, cd4, ed4, knight c6, we can play knight b5, and then we can have this exact same position achieved after d6, bishop g5, e5 and then we can do a couple of different things we can play a crazy sack line we can retreat back to e3 if we want we can play a different crazy sack line um but we can still transpose into the last pelican or we can even transpose into the last pelican from here after knight on d to, after knight b5 we can play knight f6 and do a very simple direct transposition knight f6 knight on one to c3 d6 bishop f4 e5 bishop g5 and we're right back here in direct transpositional territory. And actually one of my favorite little quirky lines to play is to play bishop f4 immediately after d6. And then a lot of times they'll try to play an independent um, Kalishnikov line here. If you play bishop e7, they might try to play some sort of independent Kalishnikov line um, or Lowenthal line usually. It's an independent Lowenthal um, line they might try to play. So I'll throw in knight on one to c3 and then I'll offer up this kind of quirky little sacrificial continuation where if e takes a 4, I'm going to play knight d5. And then if a6, I'm going to play another quirky sacrificial continuation, which I might, um, in the next video, I might just do my own, uh, its own video on just this line, um, which is its own independent quirky kind of Lowenthal variation. Um, but this video's main focus is going to be on just the last Pelican. So once we navigate through either the Kalishnikov, the Lowenthal, or the Taimanov move orders, or maybe just a straight Lasker Pelican move order, we're going to achieve our Lasker Pelican variation, which is just going to be one of the most common things that you're going to face with white when you play the Open Sicilian. So if you skipped all my other videos and you want to play the Open Sicilian, make sure you watch this one. <laughs> so e5, knight on d to b5, d6, bishop g5, begins the Lasker Pelican. So the very first thing that Black's going to do is he's going to kick your knight back. So he's going to play a6, you're going to have to play knight a3, he's going to play pawn to b5. Now there's kind of two options here. You can play sort of the old Karpov approach, which was knight to d5 right away. And what I don't like about that is after bishop e7, you're going to play bishop takes e7, bishop takes e7, and you're not going to end up doubling these pawns over here. And in my mind, it's really critical that we double these pawns. Like, Fisher thought this was really important. As a matter of fact, Fisher was a big fan in the Taimanov variation. He was such a big fan of doubling these pawns that after, you know, e6 or whatever, he would play knight b5, d6, bishop f4 here. He would retreat the bishop back to e3, and after knight f6, he would, he would, he would play the last Krapelikin a tempo down just so that he could double the pawns. Um, he got burned in one of his... Um, candidates matches games against Petrosian. Petrosian came up with a very good line against it. But then, of course, right after that match, they came up with an improvement. So this line is actually still playable. So that's how important it is to get these pawns doubled, at least to some people. And, and, it, and as far as I'm concerned, it's an important part of the last Pelican. So after, you know, we go into this last Pelican from the main line, knight of six, then e5, knight d5, d6, bishop g5, a6, knight, a3, b5. I want to take on f6 right away, because when I take on f6 right away, it basically forces the doubling of pawns. You're not going to be able to reply with queen takes f6, because knight coming to d5 with tempo is just going to lead to too deadly an attack after this sack on b5, 
we're getting way, way too much for this. This is just going to be a completely winning position for white. You know, a, a very simple kind of sample variation would be something like rook b8, knight here, and we're mating, you know, for example. Of course, that's not the best line. There, there are other lines, but just to give you an idea how difficult of an attack this is to meet at this point already. So basically, black is going to have to play gf6 here, and then I recommend the immediate knight d5. And then the main line is f5 or bishop g7. So now, I used to be a huge fan of sacking the bishop right here, this move bishop takes b5. And recently, I've had to admit that this line is not as good as I once thought it was. Um, I lost a critical game in this line. Um, of course, I, I had good experiences in this line previously, which is why I continued to play it for so long. Um, but I lost a, a critical game in this line where my opponent came up with what amounts to a refutation. So, like, I played bishop b5, and then we have a takes b5, knight b5, rook a4 is, of course, the move. And now, if you do play this line, I would suggest Shirov's move here. I would suggest pawn to b4, because it seems like other moves are insufficient. Now, I was a bigger fan of the older, older main line, which... Um, knight on b to d7 leads to apparently a perpetual kind of by force is what theory says right now. Um, I was a fan of trying to play for a win with c4. And my previous experience with this was that this was a very um, crazy kind of way to play for advantage with white and that black had to be extremely careful when there was a lot of pitfalls and Maybe that's still true on lower levels, but like I said, I did have that one bad experience where my opponent managed to play um, relatively perfect um, chess, and um, I just had to uh, kind of reevaluate um, the overall uh, position. So like rook c4 has got to be the correct move, and then either castles or knight on b to d7. I think knight on b to d7 first is more accurate. We want to force that king to d7. And then I think um, in the past I thought like Castle's King side was the best move. Um, now I'm not so sure. I think maybe at this point, like maybe everything leads to advantage black at this point if played 100% correctly. Um, but in the past I thought Castle's King side was correct, and I thought after Knight to d4 um, that White had a perfectly acceptable game after grabbing this exchange on the c4 square because the Black King is relatively loose right here. And then I basically got showed that that after bishop b7, the black king is safe enough, and white just doesn't have enough compensation for the two pieces for the rook that he's down. Uh, black has a very strong center, and the black king is plenty safe for the situation we're in. So this position should be considered major advantage black, and the, the sack line, um, for the most part, other than maybe b4, uh, which is maybe still worth exploring, um, just sh is, shouldn't be considered playable anymore. So... If we can't play the sack line, what can we do? Because the sack line is a super amount of fun. But, you know, we, we couldn't play the sack line anyway. Like, if they played bishop g7 first in this position, we weren't going to get to play the sack line anyway. We were going to have to play some sort of main line regardless. Like, this would have just transposed into theory. Um, ef5, bishop f5, knight c2, etc. We're just playing theory anyway. So my recommendation is play the um, super, super sound version of the sack line. So... If f5, what you play here is you play this kind of trappy move, you play c3, and you offer up your pawn on e4. Because if they take the pawn on e4, now the sack is completely winning. So if um, f takes e4, you're going to sack. You're going to play bishop takes b5, a b5, knight b5 is winning. And it's winning because we're now just simply controlling the a4 square directly. Rook a4 isn't even possible anymore. We would just, well, we would probably play knight c7 and queen g4 instead of taking the rook, but... It's just, it's covered. Everything's covered. So if, for example, rook b8, we would have knight on b to d7, king d7, queen g4, f5, queen f5 is mate. And so the question is, what move do we play? Like, we don't have rook a4, um, we don't have uh, rook b8, so the only other possibility would be something like rook a7, which is a typical type of maneuver in these positions to cover this threat. But here we would just take, and because we've played c3, we have queen a4 check. So we have access to that a4 square, and this is completely winning because we're forking the king and the knight. And more importantly, if they block that threat with queen to d7, we would have knight f6 check picking up the queen, which is the only way they could block the check and defend the knight. Otherwise, we're just picking up the knight. 
So, Rook A7 doesn't work. What's one other option they could try? Well, this actually got played in a fairly high-level game. This got played between two 2500s. It got um, uh, played between uh, Barbaros and uh, Tuka in the Ukraine back in 2005. And that actually went knight on b to d7, king d8, knight takes, queen g2, rook f1, bishop h3. And basically the knights all get out, so like knight e3, queen f3. And then in that game, uh, white continued with a fairly good move, but it apparently wasn't the best move. But the best move was actually played in another game. It was played in Krapko versus um, Kolaskaya in Minsk in 2019 probably with the help of, you know, 14 years of additional computer preparation, they were able to play the absolute best moves, even though they were much, much lower rated. Um, they played every, the white played everything correctly here. Um, in that game went rook g1, queen takes d1, rook takes, and then this knight came back to the perfect square. Knight d5 got played, mb4 got played, and, um, you know, the lower rated players were just, were just, the lower rated player in this case was just far more accurate with the white pieces than this um, 2,500 plus player um, who continued with queen d5, which was a, actually, um, queen d5 turned out to be sufficient. It was a very good move. Um, after bishop f1, knight f1, he continued with knight b6, queen b5, and all of his moves were, were pretty close to right on the money. Um, he, he was able to win the game, but rook g1 is technically a little bit more accurate according to the machines. But in any case, um, white, white's completely winning in all of these sacrificial continuations. Um, so you don't have to be um, concerned about sacrificing the material uh, after f takes e4 with bishop takes b5. Bishop takes b5 is completely winning. So that's the main thing that you just have to know. So if they play bishop g7, you're going to be going back into the main line. So the main line is ef5, bishop f5, knight c2. So then the people that the, the the people that most people follow in this is basically like um uh, one of the uh, games that gets cited and gets followed is like Adams versus Salov in Dortmund in Germany um 1992 um so basically in that game Salov retreated his knight to e7 and this is a pretty common maneuver the knight gets retreated to e7 but it's really important <laughs> that we don't retreat it to e7 here we need to castle first and then retreat it to e7. Now, this is critical. A lot of people understand that the idea is to retreat this knight to e7 to contest the knight on d5 and just try to get rid of white's uber knight on the d5 square. But if they do it right away, we can take on e7. And the problem is now we would have to recapture with the king, which for obvious reasons is not ideal. Because if we take back with the queen, queen f3 is completely winning. Uh, it's a very simple fork. We're forking the bishop and we're forking the rook. And since the king has not yet castled, that rook is not defended by the other rook yet. So we would have to play bishop c2, queen takes, and then after queen d8, we would mop up the rest of these pawns while black finishes his castling. And then black can give it a shot trying to play for some complications for maybe two moves. But after bishop e4 castles, queen g5, f3 shuts everything down. And now white is just cleanly up um, massive amounts of material in exchange, plus three passed pawns on the queen side. So this would just be completely winning, and it would be a ridiculously simple position to play from here for white. So we can't play knight e7 right away as black, so what we have to do is we have to castle kingside first, knight on c to e3, bishop e6. Now, at this point, I'm actually not the fan of, like, the tippy-top main line, which is actually, I think, bishop d3 in this position. I'm actually a much bigger fan of the lesser-played option here. I'm a much bigger fan of kind of the number two move in this position, which is pawn to g3. I just really like the idea of putting my pieces where I really think they belong and putting pressure on my opponent to have to try to meet that. So when I play g3, I'm threatening to put this bishop on g2, and this long diagonal is just, it's a really nice long diagonal. They don't get much weaker than this. Um, also, just because from a strategic perspective, I feel like the main goal of the position is always to control this very critical d5 square, and I should be putting my bishop on a position that controls d5. So that's just... That's just the logic I'm using here. I just really want to control that d5 square, and so I, I feel like this is where my bishop belongs. And I feel like bishop g, this plan of g3 and bishop g2 also tends to provoke, um, you know, f5 followed by f4, 
And when all of that happens, if f4 takes place, then I can redeploy my bishop to the e4 square. Um, but it can also provoke f5 and e4, and if that happens, then I can bring a knight back to the f4 square, etc. It just leaves a lot of nice options open no matter what the pawn structure conversion is in the position. So I'm a huge fan of this move pawn to g3. I don't think it's played enough, and I don't think it's fully understood. So one of the games that this was played was Adams versus Salov, and of course Adams is a big fan of um, this move as well. And Salov played knight e7 in this position to contest that knight. Bishop g2 got played, rook b8, castles, knight d5, bishop d5. So this is one of the huge advantages of playing g3 and bishop g2, is that we can continue to occupy this d5 square with pieces, which is what we should be doing. So after king h8, Adams continued with a4, and that's another thing I like about this, is white's plan of playing a4 and then playing rook takes a4, and continuing to improve his position that way is really straightforward and can actually be played under almost all conditions. So I can just kind of port the same plan into every kind of version of this that my opponent plays. So bishop h6 got played in that game, ab5, ab5, knight c2 to get out of the line of fire of that bishop, queen there, rook a6, and now we're simply targeting um, the d6 pawn. And this is also just one of my favorite things to do in the position as well, is just put pressure on this d6 pawn because I learned from Michael Adams. So bishop h3, rook e1, bishop g5, we're going to play knight b4, and then bishop to e4, and this is so happy. We're, we're threatening uh, queen h5, we're threatening rook d6. So bishop b6, and then we're going to play knight d5, hitting that bishop, and now we're threatening queen h5, rook b6, knight b6, knight f6. It is, this is all starting to come together. So f5, knight takes b6, bishop queen back, knight d7, and this is uh, both completely winning and completely gorgeous. So queen takes d7, rook d6, and then rook d7, you know, getting that rook to the coveted 7th rank and now taking advantage of the weaknesses on the dark squares after e4 and um, just shuffling more pieces into attacking positions. And now it's uh, resignable because we're threatening mate in two and there isn't a good reply. So rook h7 followed by rook g7 mate, big threat. And we also have this bishop that can come to b3 to help out. So that was Adams versus Salov Dortmund 1992. So the only question really is what do we do if they play other continuations? Like what do we do if they play f5? Well, we can just kind of follow in the same guise of, of this game. We can, we can continue to play bishop g2, say rook b8, and now... Um, there's a, a few games that we can follow that went with queen h5, uh, b4, and then castles, and then bc3, uh, bc3, knight e7, rook, rook fd1, and right here, uh, we're actually following, uh, Timonshenko versus, uh, Luther in Linares in 1998, um, which went well for Timonshenko. So it went e4, and then, you know, rook, rook ac1, we kept control of that d5 square, and we can see all these common themes um, being repeated. And Timonshenko ended up with an advantage here, and he went on to win. So other than queen h5, which is a really nice try, if we want to, we can just continue with normal natural moves as well. We can probably get away with castle's kingside. And then let's say they play pawn to f4. We can bring this knight back to c2. This was a game, um, win versus um, uh, Simonjek in uh, Kuala Lumpur in 2007. Um, this game continued king h8, followed by, you know, bishop e4, and then we're going to, you know, start targeting stuff. So bishop d5. So the threat is, of course, we're threatening to come in. Like queen h5, queen g6 is a threat. So that's why bishop d5, bishop d5, uh, knight e7, knight to b4, trying to occupy that d5 square. A5, knight c6, takes, takes, and now white has a nice, comfortable advantage on the light squares. Queen b6, bishop back to e4, queen h5, queen g4, just continuing to plant our pieces on these light squares. And this is kind of what we're going for. Black has a really bad kind of dark squared bishop, and white has a really good <laughs> light squared bishop. So in these types of positions, white is always just going to be a little bit better. Um, with this light squared bishop just kind of pounding down on these light squares. So one other um, kind of possibility is that white can try to continue um, with a4 is kind of an idea. So like if we castle and let's say they play king h8. If we wanted to continue with a move like a4, um, we can actually certainly do that here. Um, we can continue with a4 and we can try to play this position similar to 
how how we saw uh, Michael Adams play for for um, this position. Um, but we can also continue with with moves like um, Queen H5 in this position as well. So we have options available to us. A4 is possible. We could run into F4, Knight C2, takes, 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 takes. Um, and this should just be considered unclear, and it, it should also just be considered, um, this is relatively unexplored. So, like, some wild kind of complications here could happen, like maybe f3, bishop f3, queen c8, and then we could just shuffle our bishop back to c2 to hold everything. And then after, say, knight d4, uh, I, I worked all this out on my computer, and it leads to a line where white ends up down a pawn, but he has the good light squared bishop versus black's bad dark squared bishop. So, something like this would lead to, we'll just call it tentative kind of equality. So this is going to be relatively equal, although black is up a pawn here. So maybe this is something we should avoid. So a4 is possible, and I think this is a good area to maybe explore, um, possibly try to explore a4. Um, but maybe we should um, just kind of stick to um, what we saw win play against um, Simon Jack and, you know, go with something a little bit more um you know concrete like maybe go with something like queen h5 and just play for the light squares um kind of directly and this should probably still be slight advantage white because we're we're going to be meeting um possibly you know f4 with with bishop e4 and everything should be okay okay so this is basically how you should be playing the white side of the last curve pelican variation and um, I hope that you um, learned something from this video. I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you can use these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.